Welcome, everyone. Joe Tarnowski with Range Me, and I have with me Sarah Delaney, who is the founder of Cirilla and is a Range Me premium subscriber. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the origin of the company, its products, uh, what it's doing along the lines of transparency, uh, as well as some of the successes they have had on Range Me, and including why it's important to be a little patient sometimes when you're on the platform. So, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, to start off, give us the origin of uh, the brand and and talk a little bit about the products and, and your key market. Sure. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, we appreciate being a partner of yours and I um, am building Cirilla, which is a sparkling alcohol-free beverage. It's 100% organic, um, made with mostly regenerative ingredients that we're either growing on our small farm in Rwanda or sourcing from other farmer cooperatives. Um, I spent a lot of time building out those partnerships before we even created a product. So I would say you know, a little different than some folks, like I built my product more around the supply chain and more around a mission and a purpose. Um, and this canned product evolved from that. So I lived in Rwanda, which is a small country in East Africa in um, 2009. And during that time, I was building a hospitality training program and running a restaurant called Heaven, which is now um, a great destination. You definitely should visit, come with us. We do a crop to cup trip every year where folks can spend 10 days with me in a small group touring um, different parts of the country, seeing our farms, doing the gorilla trek, safari. Um, but we end our 10 days at Heaven Restaurant, which is now a retreat. It's actually three different hotels, two restaurants, and just gorgeous in the capital city of, of Rwanda. So that's kind of where I've you know, first came to Rwanda, fell in love with the country, the people, learned a lot about myself, um, discovered the tea. I I had quit drinking alcohol a couple of years before that. And so I'm now over 17 years without alcohol. And it's just, um, I feel so good. Like, I'm in my 40s. I feel great. I'm very active, um, in great health. And I just feel like I owe it a lot to my my healthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Um, and the tea that grows in Rwanda is like nothing else I've ever had. So I got my start as actually an importer, um, selling loose leaf tea in bulk quantities and then, you know, kept some side, you know, it was more of like a side gig type thing. And, um, people just loved it so much. I started playing around with it in my home as, as most of us founders do, you know, making drinks in the kitchen, doing cold steeps throughout the summer, and just like sipping on it throughout the day. And, and eventually, you know, I had this idea that with all the breweries in Asheville and all the beer and all these taps, like why this was back in like 2017, 18, that I was coming up with the idea of Cirilla. Um, why don't we have any alcohol free options, you know, on tap, especially um, because when I go out and ask for even today an NA drink, I'm offered like a diet Coke or a club soda mm -hmm. with lime. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'll usually get. And I just, I really feel kind of left out. I feel like we're spending a lot of money on good food here. Why is there not like something better for us to drink? We'll end up with a bottle of Pellegrino on the table, which is fine. Um, so that's where the idea came from. I attended the Southeast beverage Institute, um, to learn how to keg, to learn how to really um, take my recipe from my kitchen and eventually into a brewery where we got our start in production. Um, and then when when 2020 hit, we scaled up into a, a co-packing facility, which was actually, it was, we had no choice. I mean, the brewery shut down. So it was kind of a blessing in disguise because we had to scale up, but that can be very painful, right? Like mm -hmm. making those big changes, moving out of the local town, turning the recipe over to someone else. So, you know, 2020 is when we really kicked off with um, manufacturing at a larger scale, really put all in into the cans. I'm still really passionate about the draft product, but it's definitely a smaller part of our, of our income stream. Yeah. Do you market yourself as a non-alcoholic adult beverage or just a beverage or both in different situations? Yeah, so I've we actually are adding to our can. It's an alcohol-free social beverage. Mm -hmm. People ask that all the time, like, what is the primary occasion? And it's mm -hmm. tough in beverage because 
you know, I mean, the blessing is you can, you can buy it or drink it anywhere, anytime, anyone, but we, we do have to really focus and, and niche down a bit for marketing purposes, for channel strategy purposes. Um, we're often put in the ready to drink tea sets and stores on the shelf, mm-hmm. which I'm going to start saying no to, um, it's just, it's not the best place for us unless it's, you know, a dream account and we know we're going to have the velocities we need off the shelf. It usually doesn't happen. So we need to be in the cooler or with this like alternative alcohol set, or if a store is building like an NA category or a mocktail category, but I mean, all ages are drinking this, um, especially, you know, starting mainly from like teenage and up. Four of our SKUs do have caffeine, but it's naturally derived from the tea plant. We don't add any synthetic ingredients. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting because the reason why I asked is, uh, you know, we just had our on and off premise adult beverage session on uh, for ECRM. <clears throat> and um, I moderated a round table on trends. And then uh, we had uh, Nielsen IQ moderating one specifically on non-alcoholic cocktails or you know uh, uh adult beverages and it's the hottest category within uh within the booze space it's it's uh i think i think i had numbers here it's growing it's like almost it's over a half a billion dollar category and it's growing at like 30 something percent uh yeah. and i just see it everywhere and it's again people like you people like me you know i turn 52 next year me all of my peers all of my friends from high school, you know, that are in the same age group, they've all taken a shift over the past few years where they're realizing, okay, if they still drink, it's a lot less. It's very mm-hmm. few occasions. It's, you know, you want that energy the next morning. We see how mm-hmm. it, it impacts us. Uh, so I see that across the board. And then, you know, one of the things we also talked about was younger consumers are also drinking a lot less. Mm-hmm. Um, part of it is wellness. Part of it also was that was discussed over there was uh the fact that recreational recreational marijuana is that's getting what big. i was gonna say <laughs> yep. so they're doing that too uh so but it's a combination you know they may go out have a couple of drinks and then they'll have a non-alcoholic drink yeah uh, mixed in so you're seeing a lot so it's a good time to have uh uh products like that now you do a lot i mean you're you have a big focus on transparency that uh crop to cup trip that you mentioned. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of transparency and how you really uh, uh, show your market how uh, transparent you are with your ingredients? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I like that you said show and not tell. And we're talking a lot about that, even with Mm -hmm. social media is like, can we just show people rather than tell them? I think when people over tell or over talk about their authenticity or transparency or sustainability, it kind of brings up a flag in my mind. Um, It's like, why, you know, why are you drilling this in so much where Mm -hmm. I I do think consumers are becoming more and more savvy where they, they can pick up a vibe. They can, you know, pick up a vibe if, if it feels inauthentic. Um, so, you know, it, it goes back to my origin story and really the work that I, that I've been doing with, um, people in Rwanda since then. Um, but like, I just came back from the RSFI event, which is, um, regenerative food systems investment initiative. And, um, it was all about, well, it was women transforming food and finance. And it was just a powerful two days where, you know, about a hundred of us women were talking about like really the the changes that need to happen in our in our food system, and it starts with soil health. Mm-hmm. Um, I've always been really passionate about ethical trade and just human rights in general, and more of the social part of it. I grew up on um, an organic, you know, farmland in Vermont, so I've always been kind of tuned into the importance of respecting mother nature and the planet and being really careful with consumption. Um, But now, you know, 15 or more years working in fair trade and social initiatives and building a nonprofit foundation called Africa Healing Exchange, um, where we provide access to resources for mental health, um, access to entrepreneurship skills training for our partners in Rwanda. Um, We you know, now I'm really throwing a lot of my my energy into this uh, regenerative initiative, and I do plan on becoming regenerative organic certified with Cirilla. Um, so I I try to just openly communicate on a regular basis on different platforms, LinkedIn, Instagram, um, my newsletter, Substack, um, 
And I really think people who follow our brand and drink the product, like you can, you can taste the difference. You can smell the difference. You can there, we don't have anything to hide. Mm -hmm. Um, And not to say that other companies do, but I, I feel like um, it's, it's really like conveying I think it, it comes back to conveying our own stories. It's there, you know, when I worked in fair trade, it was more on the the marketing like US side. And part of the reason I stepped out of that was I felt I felt a bit inauthentic that I was sharing stories about farmers that I'd never met before. Yeah. Talking yeah, about how this system's better for them. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know what, I can't do this anymore until I actually go there, live there see for myself and just observe and meet people that we're talking about. And um, I think we have to be really careful as brands to like um, maybe abuse like access to photographs or other people's stories, like farmers in the field. I'm real careful. Like when we showcase, you know, pictures, like who is this person? Did they give their permission? You know, Beatrice is plucking tea in the field. We work with Beatrice. Like you can hire Beatrice to teach you how to pluck tea. You can, visit her and here's how and she's approved all of that we have a contract you know so Mm -hmm. that's where we try to do it differently um i try not to talk about us and them and what like i'm doing for other like how i'm empowering other people it's more about how this has helped my life and how you know we each have this power within us and when we come together as a collective um we can we can lift each other up yeah, and you really walk in the talk. I mean, when when especially with like like I mentioned the crop to cup. I mean, you're going out there, you're taking people out there, you're showing them not just you know uh, <clears throat> where it comes from, but how it's coming. You know how the process behind it, and uh, the fact that you're treating everybody well uh, along the supply chain, right from the the farm until it gets into the cup. And that means a lot, especially for today's younger consumers that really want to know the story behind the brand. They want to know that you're treating everybody along the way. Uh, right. And at, uh, you know, and the regenerative aspect of it, uh, you know, coming, leaving the land better than when you started with it. And that's a win-win for everybody. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, all of that is great. And, and you're right. A lot of people talk. A lot of people, you know, will put out. You have even a lot of brands, they'll like take somebody snippet from a podcast and then use it to market their products. Mm-hmm. You know, like like whether Joe Rogan talks about some type of type of product or Peter Atia, Andrew Huberman, or whatever, they talk about a certain type of product. They'll take that and then they'll post it as if they're endorsing their own product mm-hmm. when they're not. And have nothing to do with it. It's just, it's like, well, they said this, you should buy this product. And that's, you know, there's so much of that, that out there that it's nice to see when someone is actually there, actually in the fields, actually working with people and, and really standing behind, you know, and the fact that you were doing a lot of this before you even launched the brand is yeah, I a mean, nice I background. Back, yeah. I mean, I was in business entrepreneurship um, in my 20s and then really actually like kind of had this period of time where I I felt a little directionless not I just felt like this isn't I'm not doing the thing that I'm Mm -hmm. meant to be doing and I decided to go Mm -hmm. back to school got my master's um really studied organizational management um leadership and change which was um sort of a hybrid of of an MBA program combined with impact driven leadership Mm -hmm. so I also learned about the nonprofit sector and my um a lot of my research was on how can we merge the sectors and kind of build a bridge because I don't think it's one or the other. I think all sectors need to work together when we're tackling a really big change that we want to see in the world. So I did take time out, um, built a nonprofit foundation, learned a lot about <laughs> fundraising, <laughs> <laughs> a lot about board management, and actually you know, those skills are serving me today, which I hadn't really thought that I'd be doing fundraising again like this, but um, it's been really helpful. And um, I do think nonprofits serve a great purpose, but I I think it's more of like in emergency situations. I think that um, entrepreneurs and um, impact driven products and businesses can make a a huge, huge impact in the world. in terms of like 
creating social and economic change. So I see it as, you know, a, a vehicle for good. Um, and then when there are certain specific things that we need to tap into, you know, 501c3-4, or if like, you know, we're working with a small farm in Rwanda, they're looking for a grant to expand their land. Mm -hmm. um, we just did a, a big water project with Rotary International. And so we had done a pilot at our herbal farm with just one tank and some pipelines that we could create water irrigation so they would be able to farm year round. Mm -hmm. And year round farming allows them to continue their regenerative farming operations on a regular basis, but it also produces, they're able to tap into that water for their home gardens to grow food for their families and local markets year round, which means their children can go to school year round. They don't have to spend their days collecting water. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was really successful and caught the attention of Rotary International. And then they funded an expansion of that, which is now we were just finishing up this month and that's reaching seven villages in the area. Wow. Yeah. So the benefits about. ripple out in many directions across many different people, too. I think that's that's what's so cool about it. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So um, you've had so you've been on range beat for a little while. And uh, can you tell us about your experience with it? Because it's unique. You've seen you you've had success, but a lot of different types of success, whether it's <laughs> quick ones long-term <laughs> ones uh take us through some of that uh your history with history with range me and your experience mm -hmm. on it you know i think i got started with a free so i had a line of loose leaf tea before and i think mm -hmm. i was testing out maybe the free version initially <clears throat> um and then you know i was lucky enough i met um for at um i can't remember if we met online but we eventually met in person and we had this great um small like regional trade show here in North Carolina called mm -hmm. flavors of NC. Mm, okay. um, and it's, it's an incredible show. I mean, it's within driving distance from mm -hmm. me. We have great regional buyers from like major grocery chains and also small independent restaurant stores. Um, it's just like an afternoon and it's such a great ROI. Mm -hmm. So he ended up coming to that um, I think that connect... said it was Veer who went uh, to that yeah, one. Yeah, I know we yeah. work on that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, and so now, I mean, fast forward, there's, I think, a collection on Range Me of the flavors of NC yes. show, which is super mm -hmm. cool. I mean, we've reached some buyers that way. And, you know, so I've definitely benefited from the, the premium subscription. It's definitely worth every penny. Um, if you think about how it's spread over the course of 12 months, that subscription, um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to log in more often, but I would say like at least monthly, I spend like a good amount of time on range me probably every couple of weeks I'm in there. I love looking at the insights, like who has come to our profile. I mean, I noticed this week we have some key retailers that I've actually been trying to get in front of, and they've been coming to a profile like day after day. And I'm not sure like why so frequent, but it's exciting to see that. And it also, you know, triggers me to look at, am I, you know, do I have their calendar review in front of me? Like, are they looking at beverage right now? Did we submit, you know, so it's like this checklist of things that it triggers. And I'm finding a lot of the relationships I have now with existing retailers or distributors initiated from arrange me. So I wouldn't say range me is not necessarily the place to close a deal although it's happened, I mean, we have messaged with some smaller stores and they have ordered that way. I see it as it creates, it moves like a cold lead into a warm lead, right? And it starts to build that relationship. So by the time we see them, hopefully in person at a, a show that's coming up quickly, um, or, you know, in one example, I actually didn't even know this was sort of coincidental, although I don't really believe in coincidences, but I was looking for, I had attended a college and university show this summer up in DC. And I came away from that show with so many people saying like, you need to work with Vistar, you know, we want your products on campuses. Like you really should talk to them. So when I got back from that show, I was on LinkedIn, like looking who would my buyer be at Vistar. They were super responsive. And then 
the buyer, Ivana, she's like replied when I sent her a message and it happened within probably a week. We actually started doing a paperwork as a new vendor. Wow. But here's the thing is like, she said, when we, when we talked, we had to zoom the following Monday and by the following Wednesday, I was filling out paperwork. So the following Monday, when we had the zoom, um, and she is in Colorado and I met her in person, like a few weeks later, by the way, um, she said, oh yeah, I'm, I started doing my presentation. She's like, oh, you know, I, I already saw you on range me. Like, I know what you're about. We want to work with you. So it was the right timing. They were looking for brands like ours, women owned, they had seen us on range me. So it was, we already were familiar. I don't know how that would have gone if she hadn't already seen, she might never have even replied to me. Yeah. Wow. You know, that's a good point. It's like uh, I used to work in the trade media. I was an editor with different trade publications for about 20 years before I came here and had one guy that was a marketing guy, but he would contribute columns uh, mm -hmm. every month for years. And I asked him, I'm like, did you ever make get any business from your columns? He's like, not directly, but here's how I get my money. He says, when I'm pitching somebody, they do a Google search for me. And then they see my columns and it adds credibility and helps close the deal. It's exactly kind of what you say. You know, they find you, they know you on range me. And then uh, they, you have all the information there. And since you're checking in regularly, I'm assuming you're updating it regularly and refreshing yeah. it. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, I, I, I recently, I don't, I attended like an informational session just to make sure we were on track with like different certifications we were talking about and like what's trending. And now when I log in, I love there's, there's a column um, and it's in the insight section and it's, it shows you how someone came to your profile. Was it based on a search? Was it a targeted search or was it just general browsing or was it um, because you're in a specific collection? And so now we're showing up in some like trending hot collections and like a sustainability collection, but I had to reach out, you know, to make sure like, how do we get in those? Like, do I have the right, Mm -hmm. certs on my profile and and Vera's been super helpful with that very responsive and it's just great to be able to reach out to him anytime um but yeah it's just it's it's interesting too like you can see in insights let's say someone searched on green tea you know I mean we all like we all want to know you know the, as much insights as we can without paying extra whether it's our mm -hmm. consumer but I think brands often overlook like retailer insights you know um, what are they looking for? Because they're often looking for, they sometimes know our consumers better than we do. And they're often looking for what's really trending with their consumer insights in the store. Yeah, especially, and then if you deal with independent grocers, um, mm -hmm. literally, I just came back. I um, Last month, I spoke at the NGA show, I actually ran a panel uh, discussion on the future of emerging brands. And um, they, you know, the uh, retailer who was on my panel, I mean, they not only are they so in tune to their markets, but they also want products that don't have distribution in the major chains around mm -hmm. their store. So okay. they have like very specific things that they're looking for um, and they want to differentiate themselves. That's their main thing is I want to be the only place that has X. And, you know, this brand or whatever. So at least yeah. within, you know, because some of them have one store. So it's not like they're a big I competitor know. to the chains, but just in their little market, they want to make sure that they're the only ones that have it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. But now you also um, <clears throat> have had a long on ramp for some some uh, of your arrangement oh, wins, yeah. too. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think patience is really important. It's very hard for an entrepreneur to be patient. But uh, it, it pays off in the end, and you're a perfect example of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even that word makes me just, like, ugh, tighten up. I can't stand the word <laughs> patience. <laughs> but, I mean, it's really our sense of time, I think, is just warped. Like, I think, um, especially for time CPG founders, like, it's, like, you have – you give birth, this baby, this product, you know, you think everyone's going to love it. It's going to fly off the shelf. Like they're just going to see it and know. Um, and so that's kind of a, a rude awakening, like realizing the sales cycle in this business, especially grocery, you know, we're just starting to get into food service. 
Um, but gr- grocery is tough. And with the calendar reviews with chains, you know, it's, it's usually once a year, maybe twice. Sometimes you'll get a cut in, but do you really want the cut in? Um, and then sometimes I suppose they'll reach out to you if they, you know, really, really already know you and want what you have. Um, but yeah, in general, I think it's, it's, it's a long time. You know, we went through a rebrand last year or two. We had to get that out of the way. And that also slows things down. Like for anyone thinking about doing pack changes or branding changes or God, God forbid, like name changes. I mean, do it quickly, mm-hmm. like get, you know, rip that bandaid off as soon as you can, because I didn't realize how, how much that would slow us down for about six months. Um, cause you don't want to put like product into the market if it's going to be changing and mm-hmm. that's just, it's not, it's not good for retailers either. So oh, I could tell you what we went through when we changed the ECRM logo. It was crazy. <laughs> I mean, you never realize how many things that logo's on until yeah. you have to change it. And then it's like, okay, pads, this, this swag that yeah. we give out all of these calendars and whatnot. And and then every single piece of media, social media assets and all that, it was just, you know, I'm glad we won't have to do it again for another 25 years or so. <laughs> and then the whole strategy and explaining why you did it. And, and it's really hard to explain <laughs> the change of a visual thing like that. And uh, yeah, so it was. But a very I think back to the, but, but the patients, too, you know, speaking of vis- visual thing, but having, you know, founders typically have a long-term vision like they know where they're going they see sometimes even the end mm-hmm. um hopefully it ends that way like as as i hope it will but mm-hmm. um it's the small steps in between and that's where the the execution comes in that's so important and i think that's why a lot of companies don't make it past a couple years mm-hmm. It's not because, you know, we hear, oh, it's because someone ran out of money or this and that. Like, yes, but why did they? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think in a lot of cases, it's like it can become so hard to stay patient, chipping away at those steps to Mm -hmm. get to that long term vision. I think we have to bring in like short term visions along the way to keep us excited and motivated and like feeling positive. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, it's sometimes it's good to be naive in the beginning because if someone said, oh, it's going to take you like, you know, for me, like we've been talking to Whole Foods for three years and I'm just like, oh, OK, it'll happen when it happens. Like I have I meet people out at events and they're like, yeah, I just bought this at Whole Foods. And I'm like, I don't think so. Like <laughs> we're not there unless you know something I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I actually had a customer email me from I think they were in Boise, Idaho, I want to say. And they were like, oh, I was so excited to find Cyril and Whole Foods out here. And we had just launched with a distributor out there mm-hmm. and that services Whole Foods. And I'm not even kidding. That night I was like, oh my gosh, did we actually just go into Whole Foods and I don't even know, you know? Yeah. Like, is that even possible? I mean, it's just, and it was actually a co-op and they were just confused, but. Okay. Yeah, now, I mean, there, it can take years. Like? Yeah, years. Take years, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I don't know why, you know, it's, it's. And you have you had people that... poking into your profile over years. Like you've seen the retailers like peeking in, you know, and, and checking Whole Foods you out. Is on my profile this week. Mm-hmm. We've met with the the buyer. They actually came to our warehouse. We love it. We want it. I have no idea. I don't know if yeah. it's a timing thing. You know, personally, I have a, I think faith, whether someone's religious or not, like some kind mm-hmm. of faith is so important to stay alive in this business yeah. because for me, it's like, I've just turned it over. I'm like, I'm not in charge of that account. Like when it happens, it happens. They know who mm-hmm. we are. We submit when it comes up and it will happen when the time is right. Yeah. And I think, I think it's a protection where it's like, that's the kind of account, like we want to kill it in. Like mm-hmm. we want to be a category captain. We want to be in the cooler. I don't want to go in on the shelf. You know, I don't, I don't want to have mediocre sales. So I think, you know, it's just kind of the universe saying like, when you're ready, it will happen. Um, and so I do believe that in a lot of accounts and not to rush it too much because I know in the beginning, like we do want to rush it. We want to go into all the stores, but there's so much education, like so much learning we have to do along the way. And I think it's better to make the mistakes, which we are going to make on a smaller scale before we just, you know, go into like Sprouts National right Mm -hmm. out of the gate like when i see a brand going to a national chain right away i'm like 
I don't know. Should I celebrate? We question like, against back? that. Yeah. yeah, we actually, so, you know, our recommendations, certainly my personal recommendations to new brands is to start small, go, grow organically and locally first and build and build and build because, you know, you can actually get bankrupted if you don't have the resources. You go into a major chain, a couple hundred stores, and then you don't sell through. You got to get buy everything back. And you uh, you just, there are, there are, you know, I did a panel discussion once with mm -hmm. some major chains, and it was all about how emerging brands can work with major retailers. And they did question them the same way. They said, you don't want us to inadvertently and unintentionally bankrupt you because they've seen it happen. You know, someone's, you know, and that's the other, the other thing is transparency, right? You're a big fan of transparency. So I always tell them, I say, one, you know, if you're going to meet with a buyer, one, um, do your homework beforehand Two, present in terms of the buyer's needs, obviously, but three, be transparent in what your capabilities are and what your capabilities are not because mm -hmm. better to say you can't do something now and then, you know, hit a home run later than to just lie and say you could do it and then fail because one, it'll wreck your business Two, it'll wreck your, uh, Reputation. Your reputation. Yeah. Too. And that's even worse. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, well, cool. I mean, there's a couple other, like, I think, you know, wins that we've had, which I would directly correlate to an initial connection on Range Me, which is I was just at the 7 Eleven um, headquarters. We were selected as a brand with heart. Um, it was a two day session, like, incredible, like, great, great experience. Whether we're going to go into all those 7-Elevens or not, there's 13,000 7-Elevens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that, that is massive. Um, but we learned a lot. They really do a lot with education. Make sure you're ready. You want to do this if you're selected. That kind of thing. So they had a Brands with Heart um, submission process on Range Me. Um, and then... Also natural grocers, you know, I believe we made our initial connection on range me mm -hmm. and then talked with the buyer and, and where we, we've been approved for that chain. Um, so yeah. And who knows? I mean, you know, I told you before I, I did a lot of fundraising in the nonprofit sector and I remember learning that the average donor, um, it takes them seven times to be touched, let's say, mm -hmm in some way before they make a donation. So that doesn't mean to ask them for something seven times in a row. That means some kind of touch. So it might be a newsletter. It might be a phone call. It might be seeing you in a store, some kind of little point. And I, you know, it's, it's probably, we've heard that before. It takes some consumers that many times to see a product before they're going to buy it. So I don't know if that's the magic number or not, but you know, if range me is our first touch, like, we we may not even know for sure with all the accounts that have come out of it. I think the ideal scenario, if we can, is like make that initial contact on Range Me. Definitely reach out when you see buyers looking at your profile. And then if there's a trade show coming up, an event where you can meet them in person, do it because it's fresh in their mind. It seems like they're probably looking. They know who you are. And that's a great time to to meet in person. That's that's some uh, great advice there. And uh, it's funny, a friend of mine works for a major nonprofit. Um, and we were just talking about that yesterday. She quoted the same thing, seven touches, seven touches before they do anything. Uh, because we were talking about the different ways of of touching th these uh, people, whether it's email, call, in person, you know, this and, and constantly staying in front. So I love the way it, you incorporate range me as part of that now well how many, let me just yeah. interrupt one. i want to be sure like it's super clear to founders like it doesn't mean if, if you ask someone over and over for something even like founder reaching out to founder for advice like try to scatter in just some kind of general like not asking touch mm -hmm. you know what i mean like because it just yeah. gets annoying like when mm -hmm. you keep asking someone for something like, yeah. can you offer something as well? Try to deliver value. Deliver value totally. every time you touch them. Hey, I found this article I think you'd be interested totally. in. It's relevant to what you're doing, you know, always. I think that's that's such a great point. Uh, I mean, it's something that 
I do content Y. So I try to do with content Every Y. sales. Yeah. 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 Let's, uh, uh, actually, it's funny. I have the book right here from Gary V. Jab, 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 nice. right hook. Right. So the jabs are <laughs> delivering value. Right. So for every nine jabs, you do one right hook, which is the S. Perfect. So, but you always have to deliver that value in every sort of uh, thing. Yeah. You can't just say, hey, we got this. When do you want to buy it? Over and over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned you've gotten a few, you know, whether directly or indirectly, you're working with several accounts now that through or range me in some way, shape, or form. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's awesome. Distributor, and distributors, mm -hmm. major retail chains, independents as well. Mm -hmm. That's um, great. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, to wrap up my last question, and you've touched on a little bit, but maybe just a quick summary of like your recommendations for brands uh, that are on Range Me, uh, maybe just joined Range Me. What would be like a, a few recommendations that you have? You know, one thing I've I've kind of realized lately, whether it's Range Me or other partners, is they typically offer like a lot of support that you might not even be tapping into. Mm -hmm. And so I mentioned before, like I wanted to do what I called an audit of my profile. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to make sure it was like fully optimized and don't expect like they're going to reach out to you and say, hey, I think maybe you should do this. Like maybe, but I mean, they're mm -hmm. so busy. So I reached out to my account manager and just said, if we could, you know, hop on a call and do that. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that was just, you know, a courtesy. I don't know if that's standard with my subscription, but well, it's part of it's, it is something available, but you're right. You got to reach out. There's thousands take the of initiative, like yeah. take the initiative. Yeah. And I, just because, you know, I think one risk too is like replicating your profile on one platform from another. If mm -hmm. you're just copying and pasting everything, like make sure it's appropriate for this platform. Make sure like one thing in Range Me is we do show like pricing, you know, we it it calculates margins. Make sure like may seem obvious, but if a retailer is coming to your profile, they're only gonna look at the front page like initially. And you can even see if they clicked into the the product pages. So if they're not clicking into the product pages, what is it on that homepage that didn't encourage them. It's just like a website, like, mm -hmm. you know, it needs to, it needs to match like their criteria. And I think it's an opportunity to also do like a pricing and margin audit, um, make sure you're in line with your competitors and make sure that you're showing your differentiators. And, and I think you can also do like some AB testing with the different categories. If you're a product like mine, that kind of falls into a few different mm -hmm. beverage categories see what what works best um but yeah i think we've covered a lot and i think you know it's a great opportunity to combine the online the virtual which isn't going anywhere you know with these in-person events i know you do some great ones with ecrm that are really targeted um we participated in a kroger diversity um event through ecrm and i know now they're in person so that sounds like a really good opportunity um, By the way, we just have like, food service too. We just had our food service. I need service. to do uh, campus need food to do service, that. no less. I was at I a round table with twenty five uh, campus uh, uh, executive chefs and yeah. food service operators. Oh okay, <laughs> yeah. you'll love that one. It was it's it's a lot of fun. But I'll tell you more about it later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, our network's everything, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, it is. It is. Um, so, what's next? Last question is Listen. what's next for Cirilla? <laughs> what do you what do you have planned that you could talk about? Yeah, well, I'm really excited about this launch with Vistar starting in January. So um, I'm also scouting for a sales partner. Um, so we're we're hiring, we're growing, we're also fundraising. We're in a fundraising round right now. Um, and I just I feel like I've learned so much after you know the past few years. We're really dialing it all in. And I mentioned like learning how to say no now, like for certain placements, which Not is really thing. tough. And I'm telling you now that I will, but I mean, when it comes down to it, it is hard. Like mm -hmm. when a dream account shows up and they say they want you in the store, but it's not the placement you had dreamed of. I mean, that's like a very tough decision. It doesn't mean no forever, maybe not now, but I'm really focused on velocity and volume, you know, right. and, and I, I'm really understanding thoroughly that we are a partner with the retailer and the distributor. We cannot rely on them to sell our products for us. Mm -hmm. um, so how can we build our, our field team 
Um, we're starting to build a, a demo systems model that we're doing for our own our own brand, but we're going to start offering to other brands as well. Because I do think demos are critical, um, but they often fail. Like they're often very ineffective, too expensive, just really difficult logistically. So I'm really dialing in a system that works for that. Um, so those are the main things I'm focused on this year. Excellent. Well, it looks like, you know, you're certainly doing all the right things on Range Me. Uh, so congratulations on that. And also you're doing amazing things uh, outside of uh, the actual products themselves uh, with the Africa Healing Exchange and, you know, the the, uh, the Crop to Cups. So uh, you're clicking, you're, you you're kicking all the buttons. I, I, it definitely sounds should, like this... an interesting trip, that group trip over there. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so now if I could get 10 days away from uh, the office, that uh, <laughs> we'll see. But but that would be an amazing trip. Uh, mm -hmm. So congratulations on that. And uh, thank you again for uh, everything and all your uh, great advice for the suppliers out there. Yeah, thanks for your support and your time today. I'll see you soon. Yes, you will. Thank you. Okay, bye.